This is Open Door with Vince Robinson. In-depth conversations with people who are making a difference in the lives of others here and around the world. Culture is at the heart of who you are. Know your culture, find yourself on Open Door with Vince Robinson. Grand Rising, Great Dawning, Cleveland, Ohio, and the rest of the planet. Welcome to another edition of Open Door with Vince Robinson. I have an extremely special guest on the broadcast this morning. He comes to us from Chicago, Illinois, but he has an international pedigree. He is a master teacher, and the subject of his teaching is yoga, but specifically it is comedic yoga. I had the uh, pleasure and the, the, the privilege of uh, being involved in a film uh, in which he was a principal character, and that was D. Ankh, The Science of Comedic Yoga. So today, we're going to talk about comedic yoga, and our expert, our subject matter expert is Yasir Rahotep. Welcome to Open Door, uh, Yasir. Peace and greetings, Brother Vince. Thank you for having me as your guest. Well, I I have to tell you that it is uh, a long time coming, this conversation. Uh, I have looked forward to it ever since I became aware of you, and particularly uh, as a result of our participation in that film that was done by Gail Ferguson out there in Las Vegas. Uh, It was an extremely important film. Uh, I'm happy to have also collaborated with your dear friend and brother, uh, Wayne B. Chandler, uh, who was also a principal subject in the film. I, I facilitated an interview with him and the footage was in the film as well as significant footage of you in that film. And uh, the intention of the film was to bring attention to the science of comedic yoga. So uh, before we dive into what comedic yoga is, why don't we just start uh, by talking about your relationship to yoga, how you got involved in it, and perhaps some biographical information that you may want to share with us. Okay, so um, I've been doing, uh, I've been practicing yoga, comedic yoga, in combination with holistic health and wellness for going on 50 years. I, I usually tell people it's like 47, 46, 48 years, but it's, about, it's approaching 48 years. And so when I, when I say 48, 47, people say, oh, you should just say 50. So I'm just going to say 50, okay? And so um, so about close to 50 years ago, um, I was introduced to, actually, I introduced myself to holistic, a holistic lifestyle. And by, and by that, I mean, um, when I turned 21, I decided that I wanted to be, to become a vegetarian, a vegan. I wanted to um, adopt a more healthy lifestyle. Um, I just wanted to, um, I, I, I just became aware and conscious of the fact that um, the average American lifestyle, the sad lifestyle, standard American diet was killing me. And I wanted to um, um, create longevity and preserve myself. So I became a vegetarian, I became a vegan, I became a raw foodist. And this was back in the 1970s. And um, about a year after doing that, I became involved with yoga. So um, somebody introduced me to yoga. I really didn't know what yoga was, but a young lady, um, you know, took me to yoga class, convinced me to go to yoga class with her. When I went to the class, I loved the class, you know, so... Um, from that, I became sort of obsessed with the practice of yoga. So I would practice yoga for eight to 12 hours a day. Um, after about a year, I started teaching yoga. Um, and I've always done yoga from a comedic perspective, from an African perspective, because my teacher, Dr. Azahar P. of Chicago, was also African-centered, as was I at that time. And um, doing our, you know, from our research, we determined that, um, you know, that the ancient people of Kemet, you know, the ancient people who we call ancient Egyptians, um, 
practice yoga. They practice meditation. They have various holistic health practices. They have various practices that we would call things like massage therapy, reflexology, acupressure, um, so on and so forth, right? Um, energy healing, using the hands to transmit energy from one person to another to heal them. So our research um, demonstrated all of this. And so over time, we were able to research to demonstrate that there was a type of yoga and meditation that um, our ancestors were doing. And so as I began to teach, um, I began to, um, over time, certify people to become instructors. Um, I started a comedic yoga school um, where we train people to become instructors um, because I felt that this knowledge, this, um, you know, this information, this approach to yoga needed to become a um, foundation of the African-centered movement because in our movement, in our political movement, in our movement for social and cultural regeneration, um, what was lacking was health, wellness to a lot, lot of degree. What was lacking was the ability to learn how to manage stress, how to go inside of oneself and um, really be creative and really um, solve those internal conflicts that we have within ourselves that really hold us back from achieving the true greatness that we have within us, right? So I felt that we needed to have more teachers. And so I created, um, you know, this, it, it, it's become a global movement. And so, um, I, so I kind of refer to myself without any type of ego or anything like that as the leader of the global comedic yoga movement because that's what it's become because we have trained and certified over 10,000 instructors all across the world from um, out, out throughout North and South America, the Caribbean, <clears throat> Europe, um, into Australia, New Zealand, and um, Africa, all, you know, just all over the planet Earth. So, um, so that's something that I, I am proud of that I can that I can say. And I'm also a social worker. Um, I've done social work for decades. Um, I have a degree in social service administration from New York, Chicago. I have um, studied with some of the great masters um, in our, you know, in our um, historical um, scholarly community from Yosef Benjo Kanan to John G. Jackson to Jacob Carruthers. Um, when I worked at the Center for Inner City Studies, um, working on a master's degree there, I have a, I have a bachelor's degree in political science. Um, and so, um, you know, I've just taken, you know, my own internal research, my research in terms of um, yoga, in terms of meditation, and I've sort of combined that with the academic, my academic background and my training in, as a social worker and a therapist. And I've created programs for young people, for uh, adults, for substance abusers, for people that's incarcerated in the um, industrial prison industrial complex system, and so on and so forth. So. You know, that's what I do. And I'm continuing to do those things to this day. So that, that's really interesting in that uh, your specialty is yoga, but you also have a reach into other areas that serve humanity. I know it's really important for folks to be engaged in something like yoga because of the fact that it can literally add years to your life when you take it seriously. And I was kind of struck by the fact that you said when you first got involved with it, you were so obsessed with it to the, to the point that you were practicing eight to 12 hours a day. For some of us, it's a struggle to just do 15 or 20 minutes a day. But there you were involved to the extent that you were. Uh, you mentioned uh, the ancestors and their involvement with uh, with yoga, specifically in Egypt or Kemet, as it was called back then. 
Uh, what are your thoughts about the origins of yoga? Is it something that you feel originated in Kemet or was it something that was perhaps somewhere else that they took advantage of it? What's your, what's your take on that? Well, you know, people um, often, they take a very narrow view of yoga. They just take the word yoga and they say that this word comes from India. They said it is a Sanskrit word. And I kind of question that because I know that language evolves and language comes from other places and migrates into different parts of the world. But um, I don't think that's what's important. It's the concept of yoga. The concept of yoga is that I'm going to engage in meditation. I'm going to engage in um a process where I'm going to learn how to relax myself. I'm going to learn how to focus, how to concentrate, and I'm going to induce a transcendent experience, right? And so I don't see how that is confined to a particular word. I don't see how that's confined to a particular part of the world. Africa is the, Africa is the birthplace of human beings. Human beings have done those things, introspection, meditation, deep breathing, um, so on and so forth, movements, postures, since the beginning of humanity. So how can we just say, oh, this, this didn't happen in Africa, it only happened in India, you know, and so on and so forth, you know. Um, the people of India, where did they come from? They came from Africa. It may be some people who want to dispute that, you know. Um, but if you look at the, the preponderance of the historical evidence, the genetic evidence, the migratory evidence, the cultural tracings that you can see, even the historical records that you see from Kemet, where they say that we went from Kemet into India, you know, and you look at the fact that the original people of India were black people and that there are still um, millions and millions of black people that live in India to this day, that um, we can see that there was a migration and a connection between India and Africa. And when we look at the um, cultural aspects of India, when we look at the spiritual science of India, we can see correlation between that and ancient Kemet and Africa in general. So just to simply confine, the, just to simply get uh, caught up in the word yoga, you know, to me it just it just doesn't make any sense. So yoga, so yoga to me is a universal practice that many many cultures, the native cultures of uh, of uh, of the Americas, they have yoga, they have meditation. Well, how come they don't have meditation? They do meditate. Many cultures around the world, they have a transcendent um, approach where they try to go into some type of a transcendent state of consciousness. And in, in Africa, we can see the pra we can see practices that involve meditation. We can see practices that involve connecting with the ancestors. We can see practices that involve going into a trance-like state to make that connection to the other world, to the world outside of the physical reality. So that's not confined to any particular place. Perhaps the word is confined, yeah. but not yeah. the place. So it, it seems to be perhaps a logical conclusion that if the Africans migrated to that part of the world, perhaps it was practices that they brought with them and then perhaps consequently uh the folks who were there became known for it but not necessarily may have been the originators i'm going to leave it there uh, because we could probably debate this with a lot of scholars who would ask for proof but uh sometimes we just have to rely on common sense uh, you are listening to and watching Open Door with Vince Robinson right here on 95.9 FM, WOVU, Burton Belcar Community Radio. I'm speaking with Yasir Rahotep. He is a master teacher and practitioner of Kematic Yoga, and we're going to talk more about exactly what yoga is 
And we're also going to give you some food for thought because this brother has gems to share with you. And we are excited to be able to do that for you. We'll be right back with more Open Door right after this. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is master teacher Yasser Ra Hotep. He is a practitioner of holistic medicine of sorts. I mean, you can call yoga medicine because it is definitely medicine for the mind, body, and spirit. Uh, he is also a licensed and um, accredited social worker, and he's doing things in the community that relate to that. But today, we are talking about yoga. So uh, as we talk about yoga, I know that there are many different names for it, many different kinds of yoga. Uh, I'm familiar with a local uh, holistic practitioner by the name of uh, Dr. James Brown, and he introduced something to me called Kundalini Yoga. Uh, he also talked about the presence of more than just seven chakras, because when we think about chakras, we think about the seven, but there are also other chakras that, that folks need to be aware of. Can you talk about uh, how comedic yoga, as you practice it and teach it, how it is different from some of the other forms of yoga that people are familiar with? Well, I'm going to say, first of all, that yoga is yoga, okay? And so I don't really try to um, say that comedic yoga is better than other forms of yoga, but it is, but there are differences. So First of all, let's talk about the evidence of comedic yoga. Let's talk about the um, byproducts that we can see. So when we look at the walls of temples in ancient Egypt and Kemet, we can see that there are people doing different positions. I'm sitting now with my legs crossed sitting on the floor. Okay. People call that sitting Indian style. You know, people all over the planet Earth sit with their legs crossed on the floor. Westerners have learned to sit on chairs a lot, you know, but we have always sat with our legs crossed, you know. Um, um, so we see movements with the legs crossed, sitting on the toes, sitting on the ankles. These are poses that we call the sesh pose. And so we say that there are, th that there are three primary sitting positions, sitting with your legs crossed, sitting up on the toes and sitting on the insteps. And so we see these poses being ubiquitous in ancient Kemet. And they're sitting in these positions for different reasons. Sometimes they are praying. Sometimes they are doing a, giving an offering to a divine entity. And sometimes they are doing meditation. Okay. Um, we see different movements and postures where they are uh, extending the arm where they are appear to be twisting to the side and going into a, a spinal twisting position. And we see that these poses, the idea of a spinal twist, the idea of sitting in the posture and, and turning your body and twisting, this is a universal posture that we do in yoga. But the way that they're done in ancient Kemet are unique because we see these postures being unique to ancient Egypt, right? We see that they are not done in that same manner. We see that in regular yoga, in hatha yoga, we see people doing spinal twists, but they're not doing it the way that we see the divine beings from ancient Kemet doing those, doing um, their versions of their posture. And then we also see them doing the same posture. We see them doing back bends. We see them doing forward bending poses, right? And, um, these, these are just postures which are universal. And then when you go into Africa and you go into, like, I've been, I've been, I, I have driven through the mountains of Ethiopia out in the, out in this, what you would call the wilderness. And I've seen people just stop what they was doing and jump up into your yoga posture, stand on their hands and bring their feet down to their head. Um, do a headstand, do a split, do different things just out of the clear blue, right? And they and they just see for some reason they see me and they just kind of make that connection, you know. And it's really amazing. Um, and you can see um, within Africa, there's something called the um, 
they have they have something we have something called serpent societies. Now, for the Western mind, they hear the word serpent, they think about all of this devil and all this kind of stuff. But you know, hopefully, people are beyond that kind of stuff. The serpent represents energy because of the way that it moves, right? And so you have people in Africa who belong to certain societies who um, believe that um, they need to harness this energy. They need to um, cultivate this energy. And so they, so they mold themselves into different really extreme postures that help to stimulate the flow of this energy through the spine, right? And so you and, and and so they and so from that they have a transcended experience where they can go into a deep meditative state and do what they and do what they perceive to being connecting with the divine, to connecting with the unseen world. Okay. So connecting with the unseen world, this is what yoga is about. Yoga is not about just stretching. We do movements and postures because it stimulates our ability. To, to alter our consciousness and to be able to um, make connections with creativity, to make connection with information, to make connections with um, knowledge and even certain types of wisdom that we normally do not have connection with. Okay, so that's why we practice yoga, not because we want to stretch our hamstrings. Yes. So it's more than just the movement. There's a, perhaps a connection with the unseen. I mean, you know, when you think about the essence of what we are, we're energy. And there are like fields of energy around us. There are meridians and other things like that, uh, that we may not have a conscious awareness of, but they are definitely there. You know, the idea of a person having aura you know, it's not necessarily you may be able to see uh, many of us with the naked eye. But then again, you know, there are some folks who I've had conversations with who've said that, well, yeah, I can see it. So there's definitely a connection with what we don't see. Uh, can you talk about uh, what some of the benefits are that come from uh, a religious and I'm saying religious, meaning that, you know, it's something that you do every day or you you're committed to uh to mm -hmm. that extent could you talk about what the benefits are of of having that that connection with yoga practice well you want to practice yoga religiously as you say meaning that you're going to be consistent that you're going to be committed to it the practice of yoga itself actually engenders commitment it actually engenders commit, um, consistency because when you begin to practice real yoga or yoga the way it is supposed to be practiced, you will have a certain type of experience internally that will um, motivate you to continue to practice. It will motivate you to want to have this experience on a daily basis, to have this experience for an extended period of time. When you practice yoga, you feel good, right? It's like you just feel good. And so, you know, you feel energized, you feel alert, um, your memory is better, your uh, ability to um, concentrate, to calculate different situations, your, dip, your, your ability to um, manage your daily stressors that you have to organize your day and to do the thing that you need to do without interruption, without becoming um, frustrated, without becoming stressed out, without becoming angry and to be and being motivated by these types of emotions that, um, you know, that sort of dominate your, you know, you, you know, your state of mind. Those are the benefits that you want to really get from yoga. You also want to get the, the health benefits, right? Because if I'm doing a posture, if I'm doing a movement and I'm extending and I'm going over to the side, I am stimulating. I'm not just stretching a muscle. I am causing my blood circulation to increase. See, um, I'm causing my breathing to increase so if i extend 
If I go forward, if I go backward, I am opening up my lungs. I'm causing my lungs to take in a deeper, um, you know, a, a, a deeper breath, you know. And um, so I'm causing my lungs to become larger and I'm able to increase my lung capacity. Increasing your lung capacity is one of the is probably the number one health benefit of your practice of yoga because so many other things are dependent upon that. When you increase your lung capacity, that means you increase the amount of oxygen you can bring into your body. You, you increase not only the amount of oxygen, but also the amount of life force which is contained in the oxygen. You know, as you told me earlier, you you, you know you practice different types of yoga. And they talk about this word called prana. So the word, in, so this word prana refers to life force, the energy, which is not one of the gases in the air, but is an energetic component of the air. Just like when you hear the word chi, you hear people talk about they doing tai chi, they doing chi gong because they're trying to cultivate this life force, this energy which is contained within the air that we're taking in, right? And so, um, so you know, these are some of the benefits. So you're, not, so you're learning how to manage stress. Some of the basic benefits of yoga is reducing blood pressure, um, reducing the um, possibility of heart attack, of cancer, of stroke, of diabetes, you know, these are very, these are things that everybody can identify with. Do you want to have diabetes? Do you want to have high blood pressure? Do you want to have a stroke? Do you want to have a heart attack? Do you want to have cancer? Well, practice yoga and you will reduce the um, possibility of you developing this, these different types of disorders and degenerative diseases that come from poor lifestyle choices. These are not diseases that are, you know, you catch from somebody else. These are diseases that come from poor lifestyle choices or lack of knowledge about your lifestyle and how you're consuming things and whether or not you're exercising or controlling your weight and stuff like that. So these are things that, that, that these are some of the benefits of yoga, you know, from a very practical perspective. If you have pain, I have people, you know, I work with people who say they have pain for 10 years in their back and they did one yoga posture and the pain went away because during that all that time, they had never thought to simply bend to simply fold their body over and come back out and take those deep breaths. And simply doing that relieves your pain. You know, it helps your digestive system. If you have problems with digestion, you have problems with your elimination. Yoga movements, yoga posture, they're going to help those things. You know, those, those are very practical. If you're, not, if you're not interested in the transformative and the transcendent aspects of yoga, be um, understanding and be interested in the health benefits, wellness, managing stress. When you practice yoga, it reduces your stress response. So in our central nervous system, we have a part called the sympathetic. This is our stress response. They call it fight or flight when you are under stress, when you are under pressure from all of the different things, all of the different um, forces that are coming at us, especially as black people, as African people living in a racist society, right? We have economic forces against us. We have social forces against us. We have political forces against us. We have issues with our families, with our interpersonal relationships. All of those things are causing us to be on a high level of stress, a high level of alert. And so when you practice yoga, you dial back that alertness. You dial it back and you reduce it. And so therefore you lower your blood pressure. You make yourself feel better. 
Okay. So you've just uh, enumerated quite a few different benefits that can come from yoga. Um, I want to talk to you about the similarities and the differences between yoga, Tai Chi and Qigong uh, that you mentioned, and also bring up our good friend and brother, Wayne B. Chandler, because there's something I want to share with you about him when we get back. Okay. You're listening to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU, Burton Bell Car Community Radio. I'm having a great conversation with Yasir Rahotep. He is a master of comedic yoga, and he's just outlined quite a few things that seem ironically to be the things that black folks in this country and probably other parts of the world experience the most disproportionately. Uh, and so when those things happen, we go to the doctor, we say, hey, doc, I got high blood pressure or the doctor does some type of diagnostic procedure and he figures out that you're prehypertensive or pre-diabetic. And the first thing that they want to do is write a prescription to you or for you and give you something that you can take to counteract those things. But there are choices that we can make in our lives, ways that we can be active, ways that we can reduce stress and they uh, can be accomplished by taking up a practice of yoga. The reason that I wanted to bring Wayne into the conversation is because I had the, the privilege of attending a, a Qigong retreat that he did last year. And um, he is just so passionate about it. And I have conversations with him and he, and he tells me, you know, hey, I've got to, I've got to do some Qigong and, and he'll put in the time and obviously at his age, and I don't know exactly how old he is, but I know he has quite a few years on me. But I tell you what, I wouldn't want to get in a fate in a fight with Wayne Jackson. I know <laughs> it would not look good. So obviously um, there is quite a, a benefit that comes from the, the practice uh, every day. Uh, and 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 he's one of those people. If if he didn't practice qigong that day, then something is wrong. So um, yes, we need to tune in, make that dedication, and experience a better quality of life. Uh, brother Yasir, it, it's it's really frustrating to me when I look around our community and I see folks with canes and walkers and in a place in their lives where they have to rely on these things for mobility. And I know without a shadow of a doubt that if folks were involved in a yoga practice or a Qigong practice or a Tai Chi practice, they would not have those issues to the extent that they do now. So I just want to give you an opportunity to share with the audience, you know, how they can improve their, their health, how, how they can improve their lives by being as dedicated as someone like yourself or Wayne Chandler? Okay, well, let me say this first about Wayne Chandler. So I practiced Qigong, Tai Chi for decades. And then I met Wayne Chandler in the 90s, I think, yeah. And, um, you know, so he's become my Qigong teacher. And, um, you know, his the Qigong that he teaches, you know, it is taking my practice of Qigong to a higher level, right? And so, um, you know, he's one of the most dedicated practitioners and teachers of Qigong and um, energy healing that's on the planet Earth, right? And um, so I just got to say that because he's, I consider him to be my teacher in that area and in many other areas, you know, and um, he has a tremendous respect and admiration for kinetic yoga. And he really, he's really one of the um, great scholars that sees kinetic yoga for what it is and for the power that's there. Um, so um, what was the other part of your question? I'm sorry. I just, uh, I, I just basically, I just want you to impart to our listeners and viewers uh, how 
And we've talked about benefits, but I just want them to understand that when they get to a certain point in life or even before oh. they get to that point in life, if, they, if mm. they're regular with it. But, but look, you know, people have to make choices. You know, um, doing yoga, doing Qigong. Like I, I call Wayne, every time I call Wayne, I say, what you doing, man? He say, oh, man, I'm about to do my practices or I'm in the middle of my practices and stuff. He's always doing his practices, right? If you are deciding that you're going to be a functional, successful, um, you know, um, productive person, who is going to get the most out of your life, you need to engage in some practices. You need to engage in yoga, Tai Chi, some type of movement. I have another good friend here in Chicago who I hang out with all the time, and he swims every day. He's 75 years old. Every time I talk to him, he's like, I'm on my way to the pool. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. He's on his way to the pool. Are you going to are you going to put in the time? You cannot get benefits if you do not put in the investment to get the benefits. If you want to if you want to have money, let's say after a certain time, you need to invest your money so that you can get the dividends, get the interest, or get whatever the whatever the um the money is going to accrue over time. So to get the health benefits, you have to put in the time. Many people, especially my brothers, they keep saying it's too late. I'm too old. Um, I'm too stiff. I'm too this. They always have a I'm too excuse. I'm too much this. I'm too much that. It's always something negative that they put onto themselves, you know, that's, that, 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 that gives themselves an out to not put in the time. If you did yoga for five minutes, if you did yoga for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you don't have to do no seven, eight, 12 hours a day like I did. You can do yoga for just a few minutes a day and you're going to get some benefit from it. If your pain that you have, if your, if your lack of mobility that you have is at an um, eight and you reduce it down to a four, that's progress. That's a big change. That's a that's that's a that's an improvement in your quality of your of your life. You know, um, to move around without pain, to move around with less pain. Maybe you're going to have pain for the rest of your life, but you have less pain. I teach senior citizens. I have a senior citizen class that I teach every day. I'm a senior citizen. You know, I'll be seventy years old on my birthday. You know, in, in a few weeks. But so I'm a, I'm a senior. I do yoga, you know, um, and I keep moving my body because my body is requiring that I move. And so yoga increases your mobility. I teach a senior citizen class. We don't do it in chairs. We do it on the floor. I have students in their 80s and 90s. They get down. They, they get down on the floor and they stand up from the floor. And I teach them how to get up and how to get down, how to use their muscles properly, so that they can have a high quality of life as they move through the years. Right. So um, all I can say is just a matter of mindset. We are so addicted and so brainwashed by the medical system that we believe everything the doctor says. We be, you know, all of these different systems, all these different medical systems are set up in such a way where they, they may be good if you get an accident, if you get shot, if you get in a car accident, and you got broken bones and stuff like that. They're good for that. But when it comes to internal issues that you're having with your body, it, Western medicine is not set up to deal with that in the most optimal way. But they have all of these well care, um, you know, supposedly preventative systems set up, which are designed to take your money. And people go to these places because, I, you know, by me being the age, I'm, you know, I get my little social security, I go to the place and I, 
try to take advantage. You know, I got a little, like I got a little pain in my finger from injuring my finger, so I want to go get an X-ray. So I got to go and deal with these people. And you know, all they're trying to do is get me to get involved with these ways that they make money off of older people. And older people, they they want to feel cared for. They want to feel, um, you know, like somebody is looking after them. They they like to have people talk to them real nice and stuff, you know. So they get caught up into these medical systems that really, in the long term, don't really do them a lot of good. And they need to be doing something like yoga, tai chi. They can do chair yoga. They could do Tai Chi in a chair. They could do Qigong. And they would really get a lot more benefits from that. But the government is not paying for those things. The government don't pay me to teach people yoga. You know, they don't pay me to teach people how to eat properly. You know, people have to be able to do that, do those things on their own. So that's one of the that's one of the um, weaknesses of the American healthcare system. I think the American healthcare system has a lot of positive aspects. But one of the negative aspects is that they don't pay pay for the things that are really going to help people from a holistic perspective. And so you have practitioners like myself, like Wayne Chandler, like people who teach dance and um, any type of movement modality who don't get um, any type of compensation and, um, you know, from or reimbursement from those systems that are supposed to be helping that's supposed to be helping to keep people healthy. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the, the real issue is there's no profit in curing things. So if they can keep you coming back for that prescription or for that procedure or whatever, that doesn't really solve the problem, but just helps you deal with it, then they can continue to get paid. Um, I want to uh, talk about the importance of breath uh, you you mentioned that practicing yoga enables you to increase your lung capacity and, and enables you to get more oxygen in. And I know we're living in a time where, you know, breath is uh, it's it's a subject that we come to every time we mention something like I can't breathe, you know, post George Floyd. You know, this has become a mantra and I've taken exception to that. Because I think it's important for us to speak in the affirmative and not the negative. So uh, I just want you to expand a little bit before we go to our next uh, pause about the importance of breath and the significance of breath in the practice. Well, you know, you can go for... I I went on a 40-day fast, no food, I didn't die, right? You can go for a period of time without water. You can only go for about five minutes without air unless you are a yoga practitioner. Yoga practitioners, we can hold our breaths for a long time. You know, we can hold our breath underwater for like six, seven minutes. That's what we, because we practice that, right? But you need to have breath. You need to, your, your, your respiratory system, this, this is, break down the word respiratory, R E S. P-I-R-A-T-O-R-Y. The middle of that word, the root of the word is spirit. Okay, S-P-I-R-A-T, spirit. Okay, we know spirit is spelled different, but that's basically what's what's in the middle, spirit. And so the beginning of the word, R-E, to do again. So every time you take in a breath, you are re-spiritizing yourself. Okay, you hear you often hear certain types of Christians talk against yoga, and they talk about you bringing in demons and all kind of crazy stuff, right? But rest, but in the Bible they talk about yoga. They say that God took earth, shaped into the shape of a person, and then breathed the breath of life into it. The first thing you do when you come into the world is take your first breath. The last thing you do is release your last breath. So in between the time, what are you doing with your breath? Are you just breathing in and out mindlessly because that's what your autonomic nervous system does? Or do you begin to consciously breathe 
and use controlled deep breathing to regulate your blood pressure, to increase your digestive system, to help your eliminative system, to, to, to help your circulatory system to function better, and so on and so forth. This is the, you know, these are the things that people have to ask themselves before they start to believe these religious fanatics who want to teach them that doing something as simple as breathing in and out slowly is going to cause a demon to jump inside of them. There's another reason that this is significant, and I'm going to drop that when we return. This is Open Door with Vince Robinson on 95.9 FM WOVU. My guest is Yasser Rahotep, comedic expert, and we're going to talk about the relationship between grief and the lungs when we get back. This is Burton Belcar Community Radio. Welcome back to Open Door with Vince Robinson. My guest is Yasser Rahotep, and we have been talking about the importance of breath. The reason that I uh, brought up this is because for whatever reason, and it just could be purely anecdotal on my part, but it seems like post-pandemic, we have been experiencing an increase in death and are dealing with death. And what happens when people go through that transition is that the families who are left behind experience a lot of grief. And grief, as I'm told, is something that is expressed through the lungs. So when folks, they experience grief for an exorbitantly long period of time, it takes a toll on their vitality and, and their life, really. I mean, some people experience grief and then after grief, or during grief, they go into depression, and then when they deal with depression, then they, they're uh, affected by stress to an even greater level. So I think what you've stated when you talk about the importance of breath and your ability to increase the benefit to yourself as a result of controlled breathing, you can perhaps push back on the negative effects of grief. Uh, what would you say? Well, absolutely. Um... All of our emotions have a corresponding biochemical component, right? So when you feel bad, when you feel sad, when you feel depressed, when you feel angry, when you feel sorrowful, when you feel grief, there are specific types of hormones or neurotransmitters or chemicals that your body produces that create those feelings or those moods in you because you had that particular thought. So first, you have the event that takes place. Somebody or something happens that you perceive as being, you know, a, a loss to you. So you go through this process that we call grieving. As you go through this grieving process, your, 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 your nervous system, your, your endocrine system, rather, your glandular system is producing these particular hormones that are associated with that particular um, mood that you are going into. And so when you start to practice yoga, you start to... Uh, reverse the secretion of those um, hormones that make you feel that way and you are able to actually replace those hormones that produce feelings of anger, grief, despondency, depression with hormones that make you feel good. You are actually to um, you are actually able to, rebalance your whole your hormonal output and so those hormones you know because when you talk about the, the connection between grief and the lungs you're talking about in the wayne chandler you know area right because he talks about doing certain sounds to see, you know he he do he you know qigong is a vibrational energy practice and so there are certain sounds that help to balance the lungs balance the heart balance the liver, balance the kidneys, and, and so on and so forth, right? 
And so, um, and so that's what he teaches. And so we know from, um, you know, we just know that our ancient ancestors in ancient Africa and Kemet, that they had a knowledge of this idea, these ideas of um, vibrational healing. And so in yoga, we make certain sounds. We, we make the sound, you know, we make certain sounds with our voice and with our, and to make a sound with your voice, you have to use your breath. And so you make certain, and each sound had a certain vibrational frequency. That's what we call notes. We got A and B and C and F and E and, you know, G flat and all that kind of stuff, right? And so these notes have certain energies that they carry. That's why we say, that's why we could do certain sounds. Like we might say, oh, because that has a generalized healing effect. We might say, shoo, because making that sound shoo, the word shoo is an ancient comedic word. It's a sound that comes from ancient Egypt that refers to the air, refers to the atmosphere. We might say, because the because Ra R A relates to the sun, the healing energy from the sun. And so we make these sounds in our, you know, in the context of our practice of comedic yoga, because we're trying to affect different organ systems and we're trying to bring balance. And so we can change. So if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling despondent, you can use certain sounds, you can use certain movements and postures that we do, and you will. You will, you will relieve yourself of those of that depression, you know, as a consequence. Okay. Uh, let's talk about chakras for a few moments, because I know that some talk about how chakras can be blocked and how having a chakra that's blocked is detrimental to you. Can you talk about how you can manipulate the energy around chakras in order to clear them and then perhaps improve your life experience? Well, as you said earlier, you have many chakras in your body. So most of the time people think about the seven chakras, they think about the, from the base of the spine up to the crown of the head. And But you also have chakras in the palms of your hands. Each one of your fingertips has a chakra. You have chakras in the bottom of your feet. You have chakras in the back of your knees and so on and so forth. You have a chakra in the back of your, in the back of your head you know, to correspond with to, to the medulla obligata, right? So we have chakras. Chakras are energy wheels, okay? They are part of the spirit body. They are part of the non-physical aspect of our being. So to understand chakras, you have to understand that we have a physical body, which is this flesh and blood and bone and all that kind of stuff. But we also have an energy body that corresponds with it. OK, so when we're practicing yoga, when we're practicing Qigong and Tai Chi and, and Reiki and these type of energy, um, pranic healing and these type of energy systems, we are operating from the non-physical aspect of the body. Right. So if you're a religious person, you, you believe that you got a soul, that you have a spirit. Where are they? They are non energy. They are non-physical aspects of our being. And so we have to have an understanding that these things exist. Just, uh, it, you know, I don't want to go too long into this, but if you go to the dentist and the dentist say, I'm going to do an x-ray, they put the thing up to your face and then they, they go, to, they walk out the room to press the button and you don't, do you, you don't see anything, you don't smell anything, but you know that this x-ray was real and you can see the pictures of your teeth and you can see, and, and, and the doc, they, they put a lead, a lead apron on you from your neck down to your chest to protect you from that x-ray that you cannot see. So we believe that x-rays exist and that things that we cannot see exist. And we know that they are very powerful. So we have powerful aspects of our being which we cannot see with our physical eyes. And so part of those, part of that non-physical aspect of our body 
are the chakras. And so the chakras are wheels of energy that act, that act like certain organs and they move the life force and energy through the energetic system of the body. And they help to move the energy through the channels that are called meridians, according to traditional Chinese medicine. Ancient, ancient Egyptians had knowledge of all this stuff. But in ancient Kemet, the two chakras that they paid the most attention to was the one at the crown of the head and the one in the middle of the forehead. And so when you look at the symbols of ancient Kemet, you're going to see the crown chakra pictured, often pictured in the form of a of the sun. And you're going to see the one in the middle of the forehead picture, often pictured in the form of a snake, of a cobra, okay? And not the kind of snake where everybody got to get scared that it represents the devil and all this kind of stuff. The snake again represents energy. Go to your doctor's office and he got he got a staff with two snakes going up like this and wings at the top. That is an ancient Egyptian symbol. Yeah, but you talk about to, talk yeah, about go, appropriation. Yeah, but you go to your Christian doctor's office and you see this on the wall, but you're scared to take a yoga class because you think a demon gonna get inside of you. Wow. Well, speaking of taking yoga classes, I just want to make sure that uh, our listeners and our viewers have an opportunity con to connect with you because we're just about out of time. Uh, if, if folks can, if our folks are interested in, in, in contacting you, what would you recommend that they do? And, and I also have to ask if you uh, offer any virtual classes. We have virtual classes. Um we have virtual classes. So I suggest people go to our website, which is kineticyogaskills.com and um, call or call me at 773-396-6613. You know, I'm always available. And, you know, all you got to do is call me. I answer my phone. I talk on the phone myself. Or you go to the website. You can see what we have to offer. You can sign up for classes on the website. You can sign up for our um, virtual courses. We have virtual course that you can take to learn Kemetic Yoga on your own. We have a virtual course where you can take classes, you know, with me on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Sundays. I mean, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. We have virtual courses where you can become certified to become a Kemetic Yoga instructor. And you can also come to Jamaica with us every January and every July and come to a, a transformative retreat where, you where you'll be in the sun, in the ocean, doing yoga every day, eating fresh fruits and stuff and healing yourself on every level. Or you can come to Kemet, to Egypt on our annual, we do two annual trips to Egypt every year. And you can um, just come to be a participant to learn and see about the history and the culture and the spirituality. And you can become a certified instructor by attending one of these um, um, excursions, these exotic tours, as I call them, you know, into the continent and so on and so forth. So there's well, many different things that you can do with us. I, I want to testify to the effectiveness of your instruction. I know a few uh, local yoga practitioners that, that practice what you practice, and it's changing lives, and it's improving the health of those who participate. Thank you for joining me on Open Door, and I look forward to our next conversation where we can bring more knowledge about the benefit of comedic yoga. And to those who are listening, as always, know yourself. Love yourself, be yourself, make today your absolute best day. Peace. Hotel.